Welcome to Swiss Cyberstorm in a nutshell, the program where we talk about security topics from a Swiss perspective. Uh, our guest today on my left is penetration tester Toby Zospel, founder of Pentagrid, a small pen testing gig up in Grisens. And on my right, Raphael Arroa, a successful freelance bounty hunter, came here for a talk today. My guests have a lot in common. They are both experts living in Switzerland. Tobias grew up in Liechtenstein and Raphael has a French passport. Both were employed for several years as penetration testers and they both decided they no longer want to do this. For Tobias, the response was to found his own penetration testing company to be his own boss and Raphael went fully professional as a bug bounty hunter. Toby, uh, before we want to uh, dive right in, I want to say that I have a stake in this because I'm in close contact with one of the bug bounty companies in Switzerland, but that's not the reason we're doing this here. The reason is this is an important topic and I invited two experts here to talk about the differences and the similarities between penetration testing and bug bounty hunting. So Tobias, do you get the feeling that Raphael is eating your cake? Is he taking away your business? How's it working right now? Hi Christian. Um, no, I don't think so. I think bug bounty hunting and penetration testing are two not totally different things, but uh, two things that have very different rules and uh, very different environments and not only uh, rules in the technical sense and what you're allowed to do, like the scope and so on, but also in the economic part and uh, that's why we're going to talk about it because it's not the same, right? Um, I think penetration testing um, has been around for a longer time and uh, it also provides um, often more context, that's at least my opinion. Um, you can also get a lot of security consulting with the penetration test, so you can get, I would say, um, more information around your bugs, whereas bug bounty is more fo focused on single bugs usually. Um, so just a small example, what we usually provide, for example, is if we have two bugs and they're low severity, but they play together, you can get a high um, high risk finding bug, right? And the more you get um, to know a company and the more pen tests you do, the more you build up a security knowledge about the company, the environment and everything, and you can provide services. So I think there's an added service to penetration testing. And I also think there's um, plenty of uh, bugs out there, there that have to be found yet. Right? There are enough bugs for everybody. And <laughs> there are enough bugs for everyone. Yeah. And then there's also the thing that I think you need a higher security maturity to do um, to, or to have a bug bounty program at all. I mean, small companies, that's not possible to do a bug bounty program, right? And even if you've never done pen testing, I think it's probably a very bad idea to start bug bounty, a bug bounty program. Right From the start. Away. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think it's really good to get a very large scope. Um, but then also this large scope, um, I mean pen testing can also be internal pen testing, right? An internal network. And how you provide that in a bug bounty program will be hard, right? How do you provide access to everyone to your internal network? Do you want to do that? And here's the last factor then, trust, right? You can trust bug bounty hunters, but the how bug bounties are set up, it's made for everyone, so you have to trust everyone, which is not that easy, right? So you have to be really sure with your own security to be able to stand there and say, everyone is allowed to hack me because I'm pretty good already. So I think when you invite a pen tester, you get a better opinion and you can also do with the report whatever you want and you can use it how you want and you're in charge. Whereas for bug bounties, you can set your own rules. That's also another topic we need to talk about probably. But um, it also means that somebody else outside your trust zone might have knowledge about your security bugs. And you have to pre prepare for that. You have to think about that. You have to be ready for that. <laughs> Okay, that sounds, just, this penetration testing thing sounds like a very, very good thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that was good advertisement. Raphael, what can you bring to the table then, what he cannot? Do you, do you see uh, an additional value? He says it's 
com complementary? Well, first of all, uh, most of what he said, of course, is true, but this mainly applies to public bug bounty programs because nowadays I would say that 80% of all bug bounty programs are private and use okay. vetted, uh, selected researchers and so you might have more flexibility with your rules and even gave, give some access, some accounts on uh, scopes that need to be audited. It is true that for uh, maturity, uh, it is better to do penetration tests beforehand. However, uh, you now have uh, new options in bug bounty programs where you can have bug bounty programs for a limited time and a limited uh, and a, a capped uh, level of uh, bounties that you wish to award. Mm -hmm. So these concerns are, uh, can be resolved with private bug bounty programs. And I think that um, although penetration tests brings consultancy to the table, then bug bounty hunting brings um, flexibility uh, on the table because um, you are more flexible. Uh, for example, let's say you want to retest a vulnerability yes. after you have submitted a penetration test then uh, you would, m uh, in most cases, you would need to sign a new contract with the penetration testing company. And with the bug bounty hunting, as there's virtually no bounding contract, then you can just ask the researchers, okay, can you retest this for me? And maybe you will have an additional bounty if you manage to bypass my fix. So there were times where I bypassed a fix three times uh, because the fix wasn't sufficient. And so I guess that Penetration testing brings more consultancy, for example, in a penetration test, then, then you are able to, um, to, um, to indicate the remediation after you find a vulnerability because you can spend time on the documentation of libraries, of applications, and you, you may propose a, a remediation fix for the vulnerabilities you find. And, but in, uh, in bug bounty programs, you will uh, be able to spend time on verifying the fix. And also there's more flexibility as it's not limited in time, potentially, so you may have continuous operating, um, operational security. Yes, yeah, that's certainly a main difference. I think though you can also get all that flexibility in pen testing. I think, I mean, that's, I think it, in the end it's just a contract, right? And uh, some rules um, on what you agree on. I mean, we have customers that just buy certain days per year or something like that, or a rolling release. So we can always do the retesting as well, right? And w that's also a standard procedure um, on our side. So, but, but now if I can do both with each of the options, why are then the two? I mean, I mean, that's where, where <laughs> I think uh, uh, pen testing and bug bounty hunting is very similar. Um, at the end, if you do all the technical rules and the rules about the engagement and scope and you're really rotating them as you want, then I think you get on both sides the same. Okay. But bug bounty has the uh, economic twist, right? Uh, yeah. It has another rule of the economics. So, you don't so for, for a, from a company perspective, it can look relatively similar, but for the, for the person conducting it, it's a whole different ballgame, isn't it? Yeah, but also, I mean, um, if you, I mean, yes, but also, for the company, it can be very different, right? Oh, of course. If you course. pay for every buck that is critical, you have to pay for every buck okay. that is critical. If your security posture is not good, and you probably pay for one pen test, and you get five critical findings, then that's maybe better economic-wise than having a bug bounty program, okay. right? So, so you would conclude, or would you agree that first do a pen testing thing before you start out? with a bug bounty uh, program? Um, is that yes. a standard procedure? But the thing is that, um, as you mentioned, you only pay for a bug bounty. You only pay your reward if there is a bug. So you never pay anything if there was no bug at all. So, yeah. And with a penetration test, you pay a fixed fee yeah. for a number of days. So yeah. there's also more flexibility in this aspect. So if you're more or less confident about your security posture, then you shouldn't pay, be paying much at all. So. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you can call me old school, but I think somebody <laughs> who, who um, like works and puts in time should get paid for, for his work <laughs> and, and his time he invests. So this is the economic twist I'm talking about. Um, bug bounty hunting will be done as long as it's economic for either side, right? 
And uh, the question is always, it can't be economic for both sides, right? Yeah, but that, that is the same about penetration testing. If it's True. only financial, then I say penetration testing will continue as long as compliance needs penetration testing. And who cares about the findings? Well, <laughs> definitely. I mean, but that's another thing, right? Compliance and doing uh, the fixing, that's two com completely, completely different, different things. different yeah. things apart. And I mean, yeah. the compliance side, yes, you're right. There's regulations by now that just um, make it mandatory to do penetration testing, testing, right? And you don't have to fix anything usually, or maybe you have, I don't know, all these regulations uh, it, by it heart. It really depends, but, but the tendency is and what we're seeing in the industry is people are not fixing these covenant vulnerabilities after penetration tests. And I, I personally get the feeling there is a higher tendency of fixing bug bounty bugs because they cost money. Every bug costs money and there is uh, the contract that costs, or the report as a whole, no matter how many findings you got. Uh, then I think you see a different part of the industry than I do. Oh, I'm sure I do. Um, <laughs> because I, I do think there is, uh, we work with a lot of companies that really also want to improve their security, right? Uh, maybe we're not the standard compliance only I mean, you shop. only have the best customers, of course. Uh, I'm, I'm sure of that. <laughs> well, we try, of course, what we sell is, um, is what the customer wants, right? And we find the customer that fit our, yeah. our way of working, right? And we really want to improve security at our um, customer's company. And I mean, maybe there, there are other businesses, right? Yeah. They have other goals. Yeah. Well, yes, it's, it's true, but when you, when you work as a bounty hunter, often your, um, the person you discuss with is, has a technical background. Round. And, so, and often in penetration testing, well, it really depends on who you discuss with, but uh, sometimes uh, the person you talk with has more of a, uh, I would say, managerial uh, background. It's closer to the business, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. General. And I mean, technically, if you, if you speak to a technical person, then the person will instantly get uh, what you mean when you say, okay, this vulnerability is critical, here is why. Yeah. And the manager may not um, consider it the same way. And so the vulnerabilities may be handled differently in a bug bounty reporting yeah. and in, and in penetration, penetration testing. Yeah, this is also what I'm seeing, that the, the channel into the company is different yes. and the life of the vulnerability or the report is different inside the company. And one tends to go unnoticed yeah. and the other one is right at, at the then, real... But then yeah. that's, that's more a problem of, of the company. Of the yeah. company. I mean, that's, yeah. that's like buying a gym subscription at the beginning of the year and then not going to the gym, right? Yeah, that, that has because a lot in common. In the end, yeah. if you order a penetration test, but you're not after the risks and you don't want to fix yeah. them, then why do you do them at, um, at all? Right? For compliance and reasons. For compliance, for compliance reasons. Reasons. <laughs> that might very well be, but that's a very big most missed opportunity, in my, Absolutely. In my yeah. opinion, because you can just do both at the same time yeah. with one penetration yeah. test, right? Yeah. You can get the compliance, but you can also improve your security. Okay. okay. Pushing my point a bit further. I mean, I've, I've read penetration reports, I guess, for most Swiss penetration testing companies. They're good or they're not so good. Most of them are quite of good quality. And they come into the company and then people hire me to read them for them because maybe they don't understand them or some of the findings they, Christian, could we, could you help us mitigate this? And it's a Word document or it's a PDF very often and then there are piles of these and I have rarely seen people taking them, feeding into Jira directly. Exactly. And we're tracking them from now, and we're never forgetting again. And if a new penetration testing finds the same bug over again, we can identify it in the Jira. We've spent days trying to match different, is this the same now? Is it something different? It's the same code base, different service, stuff like that. While it's very natural for a, for a bug bounty program to use an API from a given platform, feed right into Jira, triage, to the right person. So this thing's much more proficient, more professional. There is a process behind it. So because yeah, this whole penetration is indeed very old school, I have to say. <laughs> it is not old school at all um, if you hire the right company because right from the start from our company, our reports are also delivered as a CSV file for Jira import. Okay. Fun, fun you're mentioning <laughs> it because okay. that's what we get. We have fully parsable reports 
and you get a PDF and Excel file in a, in a Jira. Right? That, that sounds cool. So, so that is now so, the standard for maturation test. Yes, but that's also what we try, right? Me, for me, as a, as a founder of a penetration testing company, I want to get these risks addressed for my clients. I mean, in the end, it's their risks, not mine, right? Yeah. But I want to try to get them to understand them and be able to do something about it. And we try to get as close to the developers as possible. Yeah, uh, we reach that with different things. So, mm -hmm. for example, as you said, there are managers sometimes in the penetration testing um, area. Well, we don't have them, right? We, every one of us does the offering part, the management part, the technical part, the reporting part. And the yeah, but your customer part. is a manager very often, isn't it? Yes, and we have to like make them understand as well. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard, but Usually our customers are managers, that's correct. But what we try to do is also get down to the developer level yeah. and talk to them directly. And, and ideally then, you get to do that. And yeah. that's where the security consulting again comes in. Sometimes my job is not even to tell the customer, okay, let's, there's this high critical finding, but just to tell, hey, by the way, your developer told me this, this and that. Do you know about that? And the managers say, no, I don't. So yeah. it's more of a, a big communication thing that is still problematic. It's and, all about communication in the end. And yeah. Bug Bounty, I think, is doing a better job of like saying, you need to do it like this, so it's yeah. proper, so the things get addressed. But I think you can also do a Bug Bounty program where this all doesn't apply. If you do your rules, you can have a, a won't fix in your, in your rules, right? Yeah. You can have you can even pay bugs and say every other bug that's coming in and it's the same, you can say it's a duplicate, right? You so can it's true, but that's, it's where the platforms come into action. I mean, the triagers, okay. um, they help lots uh, um, to, to uh, do the bridge between uh, bug bounty hunters okay. and, and companies. If you're working with a third party platform provider that links yes. the program Absolutely. and the hunter, okay. And so they play an important role here and they're not existing in the pen tracing world. Well, yes, the, and, the and also there, there's an, another thing, it's that when you report a bug, you have to justify the impact. So you have to wonder what are uh, what, what is the, um, the the business angle of the vulnerability, how it will hit the business if it's exploited. So yeah. uh, you you need to uh, have some business sense when you report a vulnerability. So you have an incentive to describe the bug very clearly, so it's understood by the other company. Because if you're not, you're not going to be paid. Well, as he is being paid anyway, and he's just doing a good job if he's providing the service. But the contract is already established. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But then on the other hand, I mean, uh, I think one project, right? That's a small budget thing, right? One penetration test. And then of course, I think it all comes down to people and, and communication, right? If you have the right people on the penetration testing side, they can provide you as much value as you can get with bug bounty programs. And it's the same also for companies. I think a lot of companies don't have people who are able to parse pen test reports or don't have the power to, to, uh, to, to do something about them. And I think bug bounty is that, really that, cool because it got the, the visibility of the manager. Exactly. And that is the point. They don't have the power to make it happen. So the vulnerability is known and it's lingering around well, as soon as a bug bounty rep guy reports it, then, hey, this is costing money. If we're not fixing it, the next guy is going to report it. So, and so the this is more help action. also. Yeah. yeah. I think that's an inter interesting difference. And that is one that I observed as well. It, m it may be the same vulnerability. The treatment has to be exactly the same. Ideally, it's the same process, but it has a different color, a different framing to it from where it's coming from. Yeah. But then uh, that's more like of an uh, ideology thing, right? That's because maybe bug bounty programs have visibility at the moment. I mean, they're all the rage now. They, this is now fashionable. I mean, exactly. they have visibility because they have evolved a lot. Because a lot of concerns that um, um, ha were historically attributed to bug bounty programs yeah. uh, are, start are starting to disappear because now there are private programs. Now the researchers have been selected. Now there are triagers that help companies uh, interpret reports. Okay, so you see more maturity yes. in bug bounty programs. And, and now the, there, are, there, there are better metrics also in terms of critical vulnerabilities found, 
um, in terms of um, how many reports are valid. Yeah. I know that these statistics are improving over time because the platforms also okay. improve their algorithms. And so I would say that bug bounty is evolving rapidly and also uh, spreading a lot in Europe. Okay, so, so you would say you're adding more and more value with this. Yes. And maybe eventually even helping his vulnerabilities being fixed because new processes are being set up. Yeah, and then yeah. everybody profits in the end. Yeah. And as you said, it's a big market anyway. Yeah, yeah, it's a very big so, market, yeah. but we need to be scalable because there are more and more cyber attacks. I mean, the NS NSCS has um, shown that there are 200 cyber attacks in Switzerland every week. Yeah. And so um, we need to address a lot of companies, a lot of Swiss companies. And I think that bug bounty hunting can bring this scalability also. Yeah. That's a good uh, point. Uh, you mentioned National Cyber Security Center. Uh, only on Monday, they, uh, they said they want to be, get involved in uh, bug bounty hunting, or at least in a Swiss platform. I quote, a strategic interest in a Swiss bug bounty platform, which I think is quite significant. Uh, last week, the Federal Council responded to a uh, parliamentary postulate from National Council Judith Belaish who ask for government or administration getting involved in the bug bounty programs. Federal uh, Council said yes, that's exactly our plan. Today the announcement. Uh, and it said bringing whole page coverage bug bounty program. It seems all right. So there is something happening here. It seems to be fashionable. Companies are more and more expected to do this. On the other hand, Katie Missouri is, uh, is often being called queen of bug bounty hunting. She calls this bug bounty botox. So everybody's doing a bit of bug bounty hunting now and then if something bad really happens, they say, hey, we've been doing bug bounty hunting, so what's wrong? So we did it all. Uh, is this a treadmill that uh, just continues more and more vulnerabilities? Let's try to fix them or not and we continue as we've been doing with penetration testing for 10, 15 years. Or is this really a new development? It's, you said you're adding more and more value and the programs are more mature now. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I think in Europe we were a bit late to adopt bug bounty Certainly hunting. in Switzerland. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but when penetration testing first started, uh, companies were like, uh, what, are we supposed to pay a hacker to hack into our company? And nowadays it's everywhere. Yeah. And it's quite the same with bug bounty hunting, I would say. Uh, the, the same concerns apply and in two or three years it will be spread and... Standard. Yeah, yeah. it will be a standard, yes. Okay. And you will probably also get the compliance bug bounty program you do for uh, compliance. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I remember uh, Tanya Janka uh, presented with Cyberstorm and she said, look, a bug bounty program is one of the elements of a security com uh, program for your company. And if you're not having that, you'll, you're missing something. And I, it has its role. I, I think it has its role, especially for larger companies. I think okay, yeah. for medium and small size companies, they have different problems they, they to solve. They have different problems and I think they're way better off with the pen test because you know they also get the consulting part. I mean, or maybe they... Yeah, I mean, you need to be able to read the report exactly. and the bounty hunter will be extremely disappointed if they're not getting qualified feedback. Yeah. yeah. And then you get the reputation of running a bad program and then no hunter are interested in your program <laughs> and you look ridiculous. <laughs> Good, that's cool. Uh, let's touch on something different. Um, I'd like to know a bit, uh, we've seen differences with being the same thing. How do you guys work uh, on a day-to-day -day basis? Maybe you do your contracts, you read your scopes, but then how do you go about it? I mean, you probably by now have to cover the OS standards for penetration testing to give you a comprehensive look. Well, I imagine you can do p cherry picking. You can pick what you want to do, the vulnerabilities you think interesting, well, well as you have to do all the boring stuff. Uh, I wouldn't say it's boring, no, not okay. at all. <laughs> so, and that's also one good thing about having your own company, right? You can ah, choo choose helps. what you do. <laughs> it helps as well, yeah, yeah. So, so of course, um, when it comes to I would say technical, more interesting stuff. I think it's not different because um, you will usually get for penetration testing, the scope will usually also be modern stuff because that's what companies want to look at, right? Yeah, they want to um, test the new development. Exactly. Yeah. And um, so you have to know 
the similar thing as buck bounty hunters, right? But I think you can specialize a little bit more in uh, buck bounty hunting, probably. Would well, you agree? It, I mean, uh, in buck bounty hunting, uh, it's, it's really interesting because we can focus on uh, sometimes on legacy servers because um, sometimes there is this requirement in penetration testing where everything new has to be pen tested. Yes. But the risk is on legacy systems most um, often. So I would say that bug bounty hunting also allows to uh, have a go at legacy systems and sometimes it gives the necessary push to have these systems decommissioned or um, patched. So. Okay, uh, could, could I conclude that you are really uh, economically driven? I mean, you're going to look where you expect to find vulnerabilities. And he's probably more where the contract says he has to be looking. Could you say so? Um, I'm not uniquely economically driven okay. because I also, for example, I also want to invest time, uh, particularly in European uh, bounty programs and in particular in Swiss bounty programs because that's where I live, obviously. So uh, in a sense, there is also, we choose uh, what programs we want to hunt on. Okay. Um, and I, I really like working for, in Swiss programs, for example. Um, okay, so you could be working for Apple, where there's probably more competition, but also more fame. Yes. But you choose to also work on smaller Swiss programs, where there's less international fame, because you think it's the right thing to do, and it's nice to talk to locals. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I think it's important. It's important also for our reputation here in Switzerland. And um, I really appreciate helping uh, local companies. For example, last time I reported the vulnerability, it was not on a bug bounty programs, but uh, I ordered pizza on a website and it, it had an, an RCE vulnerability. So I just helped the, the, the company. I did not exploit it. I just found it by watching the website and I just reported the vulnerability to the It looked company. vulnerable. It, it looked really vulnerable. And it was not the ananas on the pizza? No. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> so, uh, no, I really want to help out local companies. So, um, and it's very interesting because the bug bounty uh, offer uh, has started to grow in Switzerland as well. Yeah, I, I think it's, they're now really popping up. Yeah. I also want to pick up your point about uh, us not being able to choose, right? I, I also think that's a, that's a wrong view on penetration testing because with a good penetration test, you usually get these people in early and you say like, look, we have the idea of test, of to test this, yeah. but they will tell you, well, have you thought about this interface? Have you thought about legacy systems? Have you thought about this and that? And then you probably set the scope. So there's a lot of risk modeling. So usually scope will. is a conversation. Scope for is your a conversation. conversation. And, and here it's much more a bit of a given. Eh? It can be a conversation be as well. Because sometimes you get a good relationship with the, the program owners and, and, and so they are more confident to increase the scope. Yes. Because there is some kind of trust relationship that has been going on. So, so the um, longer you work together, you more have mutual yeah. trust. And, yeah. and what, what programs usually do, they start with a small scope and then they, they increase the they scope, grow this, this scope until yeah. they have all of the infrastructure in the scope. So yeah. I would say that the scope grows as well. Yeah, yeah, that, make, that makes a lot of sense, I guess. I mean, you try this out, you get growing confidence, and then you give them more access and more permissions. Yeah, good. But as, coming back to the tooling questions. So you, you hack away with Curl, or? Yes. I know that you're working with Curl. Yes, yes, I'm working with Perp a lot. I mean, obviously, when you use HTTP, anything HTTP related, you come across Perp, right? Okay, um, and that's your tool of choice. For web, and it, web stuff or web yeah. connections, let's put it that way. Yes, but um, I mean, in our field, uh, everything can be important. So uh, at least one scripting language and so on. So we write a lot of Python tools. Um, we have our own tools as well. Um, okay, we so that is then a specialty of your company, these tools? Yes, but we usually publish them. So I okay. think in the penetration testing world, um, it's very good that people work together and publish and write blog posts and just share their, their tools. That sounds very open source. Yes, yes. Yeah. It's, uh, it's also a little bit, I mean, in most parts, I would say the old hacker culture of sharing knowledge is still uh, present because we don't rely on, on the bugs themselves to be only found by us, right? Yeah, I think okay. that's, that's one good thing about yeah. penetration testing. That okay. We don't have to hide our tools or our knowledge 
so nobody else can cash in box. Ah. <laughs> that it depends on penetration testing companies. Not ah. all companies do this, so it's a good thing if you, if you do it, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Well. yeah. What, what tools are you using? Are, I'm using quite the same uh, arsenal. Yeah, uh, in the end. I, I'm using mostly Burp Suit. I do mostly manual analysis because I don't want to break anything. Uh, it really depends. Uh, but most of the time I'm doing manual analysis with Burp Suit and other tools that I can develop or... So it's not, not like you run a scanner, you go uh, drink a coffee or two and then you come back and then you have five findings and then you dig deeper? Well, everyone has his own methods. Yeah, but what um, is yours? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, um, usually, it, it's funny, but because after a few years in information security, you, you get a feeling, don't you? You get a feeling that a website is pretty safe or not safe at all, and so you're going to focus on the website first, that, you're, that is not safe at all. It's true that it can uh, seem like you are cherry picking, but in the end, all the vulnerabilities will probably be found and also it's important to find the easier vulnerabilities first because that's the one that are the most likely to be exploited by attackers in, the, in real life conditions. Okay. So, yeah. uh, I mean, you can call this cherry picking or you can call this, uh, you focus on what's exploitable easily first and then you dig. That's a more positive way of framing it, yeah. <laughs> no, but it's good, that's good. And then you do manual analysis and then as you move on. Okay, yeah. I mean, you're not, you don't have to provide a comprehensive view and I think that is that is a difference because people are asking you find us everything here yeah and you kind of have to find more but, or less yeah, true. but it's also very interesting I mean we get customers from all kind of industries so yeah. we have uh, medical devices we hack we have um, car entertainment systems we have ATMs we have everything really um, that is somehow connected or hackable yeah so you can, you can do tools in all of these areas and get, like, Burp is just one of the very generic ones, right? And I think um, this generalization uh, of a pen tester is also something good because it, it, it broadens your view. You have to be, you have to b think about different angles as well. And, yeah. um, and you cannot always pick uh, on, on just your major topic, right? Um, but yeah, from a tooling perspective, because you asked about it, we also have our internal tools, of course, but um, we always um, get them to a certain state and I won't state to release them. So, um, for example, one of our tools just recently um, showed us that, we, that in a modern iOS application, there was RC2 decryption going on with a 40-bit key. Right? That is a bit old school. Which is ancient. <laughs> and then that sparked my interest and I thought, why is this happening? And right before that, there was a triple S decryption. And then I found out, well, this is basically just a PKCS12 standard that says the PKCS5 standard says that PBE1 um, specifies the different decryption schemes and, well, the default one is still triple S for the private key and RC2 for the certificate. To get okay. it out of a P yeah, yeah. P12 file, right? Uh, so, okay. so in that particular case, would they just apply the standard without thinking twice, or were yes. they even obliged to do it? That they way? were just using the PKCS12, which is everybody everybody's using to to store keys, right? Yeah. And I think penetration testing. What's really cool when you get these new topics, you have to think about new things on on and maybe write your own tools, and you uh, it sparks a lot of research. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, that, that's yeah. What's making it so interesting. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It only drives you to find out. That's how, also stuff. how I did all the research about Java key stores, right? In yeah. the end, that was, um, that was all sparked by a customer project because yeah. they used this kind of format and we exploited yeah. it. That's cool. Do, do you get the time to do this thorough research at all? Or are new scopes continue pushing you, come here, or calling you, this is new, come test us, test us? Uh, in fact, bug bounty hunting is also uh, used a lot by uh, academics. Academics invest a lot of time in uh, academic researchers in bug bounty hunting. Uh, for example, I mean, they, they, they work full time 
as teachers in the universities, and then they can apply their research in bug bounty hunting. They cannot necessarily have a penetration testing job, but in the, during the weekend, they spend time doing some research. Also, I've done uh, research, I've had time to uh, dedicate myself to research since I'm not bound by any contract or things like okay. that. So I can always take time for myself and, some, and sometimes find zero days uh, in, uh, in, in scopes that are uh, in bug bounty programs. For example, with the Swisscom uh, bug bounty program, yes. they accept zero days and I found quite a few of them uh, okay. while working on their program and it was worthwhile. So I would say that it does not prevent you from researching, but it rather the opposite. Okay, okay. But my impression was, I mean, as a freelancer, um, I'm also more or less working as a freelancer and outside of Bug Bounty Program, it's just your, your own boss, that's nice. Yes. But you also have to be your own boss and telling, hey, now get to work. And it's not this uh, funny feeling that you'll, you'll sleep in your hammock and you hack away and by nine o'clock in the morning you're a millionaire already. And it's, it's not such a happy life, isn't it? It really you can is. work for weeks, I propose, suppose, without cashing in at all because they're going back to you, you know it's double. Uh, somebody has reported this already or we're not going to fix it, it's no vulnerability anyway. And that is tough. You need to, to stay, uh, to keep being motivated, of course. And, but I, I would say that I've been a bounty hunter now for a year and a half full time yeah and it's been uh nearly two years and it's been working out so far so <laughs> i've lasted yeah. more than several weeks uh, uh i would say that you need to to stay focused you need to stay uh, organized it's really hard sometimes you you worked at at 5 a.m sometimes you work during the day uh it really depends uh but also this flexibility is quite good because then it helps me for example take care of my family of my of my daughter okay so, uh, so, so you would say it's not for everybody to run this lifestyle, no. but, oh, but when you're able to self-organize, then it can be really cool. Yes, yeah. totally. Okay. And it was also a goal for me to be able to self-organize, and it's one of the reasons why I went into Bantian. Okay, I see that. Interesting. Uh, here is a thought. Uh, uh, I read up uh, a report by, by Katie Missouri where she said an entry-level salary for a U.S. penetration tester is around 100K. I think Swiss entry-level penetration testers make a lot less. While uh, there are only a handful professional bug bounty hunters in Switzerland right now. Yes. So I get the feeling this is a bit of a gold rush phase, new programs popping up, but very few professional bug bounty hunters. And this is going to attract, I mean, programs like this are going to attract people to bug bounty hunting and in a year or two the prices will come down and the gold rush is over and you'll be competing for relatively few programs if it doesn't pan out. So this is a gig economy where you have a good life now but it could be really tough yes, if course. you have stronger competition. So the statistics say that around only 4% of researchers earn more than $100,000 a year. A year. So, uh, and that's what you have to make in Switzerland. To be worthwhile. Because you have to pay taxes, social security, and, and, and. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, yes, it's, it's quite a, a bad number, I would say. So this is why there is so few of us uh, bounty hunt, full-time bounty hunters in Switzerland, Switzerland, possibly. And the cost of living are so high. Yes, yeah. but so far it has worked out well for me, we, and I, I know that other bounty hunters also are doing well. Uh, so how many of you are there in Switzerland? What do, you, what do you think there are? I would say we are like five, maybe six. Five or six? <laughs> so uh, it's not much. Definitely less than penetration <laughs> testers. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> And even there, I mean, we have seen a huge uh, development in penetration testing. When yeah. I entered the security industry like 15, 20 years ago, there were a handful of, a small handful of companies. Yeah, even 10 and years I, ago, there were only a, a yeah, small and handful, then, I would say. Yeah, and they all seem to get along nicely with each other, yeah. so it, competition can be so hard. Yeah, the market grows quicker. Yeah, yeah, than yeah. And the yeah. competition, I think. Yeah, I see. I see. But there is only uh, there is only six of us. But maybe it's because there are only uh, it's very hard to get over let's say a hundred thousand uh, dollars a year. Or so it's still very new in Switzerland. Yeah, and it's still very new, new, of course. Yeah, we'll uh, see how this develops. But it also means that the, the hunters uh, maybe they have they are battle hardened. I would say. Yeah. 
uh, they have proven yeah, it seems their, you their professionals skills. you started as penetration testers yes and you did not right off from school I'll be rich now because you have a lot of experience the, in what you're doing. It's the case of most bounty hunters, hunters yeah. that do this professionally. Yeah. Because it's if you it. start out without the experience, you're not cashing. I'm a little bit worried about that part. Um, I think uh, it's a little bit the gray area of employment law um, where, I mean, you're self-employed, right? But that also means you have to play by the rules, right? You have to pay that and secu social security and so on. So you have to do that. Then you don't get uh, an unemployment uh, coverage, right? I mean, you're, you're getting out of that part. So there's more risk in there. There's more risk in, I would say, a lot of areas. So self-employment is not for everyone. Uh, self-employment is not for everyone. Th that is true. But if, you, if, if I don't succeed, then I would go back to the industry. So, yeah, because yeah. there's a sh quite a shortage in security skills There's, in Switzerland, yeah, I so mean, I would say that being in security is industry is nice anyway, and nothing yes. bad will really happen. Yeah, that for you, that helps for <laughs> you and me. It works out, right? But that I'm not talking about us. Otherwise, we wouldn't be yeah. sitting here, right? <laughs> um, I think rather there's mi there might be a long tail, yeah. I especially internationally. Maybe not in Switzerland, but internationally, yeah. I'm a little bit worried. And uh, I mean, it, the liberation of of yeah, working without getting paid, maybe. Yeah. Is is worrying for me, but yeah, it, as long as it works out for you, it is great. I mean, yeah. there's this famous quote of um, it's a genius way of starting a business, um, especially because nobody's doing it, and it sounds like a bug bounty hunter said it, but it's actually a Uber driver in 2015, right? Because back then nobody was driving Uber, and when you drove a Uber, you could do 250k in the US, right? And I think no this Uber driver... This seem to be over now. Yes, exactly. No <laughs> Uber driver will repeat that nowadays, yeah. I would say. Yeah. So, you know... It's interesting, Arnold. Yeah, and see it's, that. A very, it's a very, very yeah. open economic Good. thing. Uh, time is running quickly. Let's uh, see what we could... Co I mean, I have so many notes here. <laughs> uh, law in Switzerland is a final question. I mean, we have the famous hacker paragraphs, 143. 44 criminal law in Switzerland. I presume this is not affecting you at all because you're in a contract relationship with the company. So you're, you're covered. Well, For you, you seem to discover remote code execution when you're ordering pizza. And are we entering a gray area here already? Or so are you affected by this? Uh, as long as you do not do the intrusion itself, then it's not a gray area. But I would say that, yes, the Swiss law, Swiss law is uh, insufficient when, uh, when, um, when, when it comes to good faith security researchers. So good faith security researchers are not covered Absolutely. by the law. And it can, be anybody, it can be research done by anybody, by developers, by system administrators. By, and and I, I think that the law at this moment is more detrimental uh, to the security posture of companies in Switzerland than it helps them. Okay. Okay, because, because it prevents security research. Yes, some people might be deterred by yeah. it. Yeah, okay. And it would be a good thing, for example, if the, the notion of good faith is added to Article 143, because uh, th there is this notion of good faith in, the, in Swiss law, for example, in Article 5 of the Constitution or in Article 2 and 3 of the Swiss Civil Code. Mm -hmm. And so it says that it, it, it can be presumed that people are acting in good faith if they have shown diligence in what they are doing. Okay, okay. And so this And in the criminal code around hacking, that is not there. That is not you're, here. You're either a company or you're a criminal. Yes, if, if the company uh, presses charge against you for intrusion, that, well, it, and if you did the intrusion, even if, if it was in good faith and you have leaked nothing and you have like uh, contacted the company and, and so on, well, you, you can get into trouble. There is no restriction to this law. Yes. And so act, uh, uh, adding good faith in this law, yes. good faith research, may help uh, judges determine if the hacking was done in good faith or not. For example, if you have contacted, let's say, uh, the GovCert of Switzerland, of yeah. if you have contacted the company and say, okay, there's a problem here. And then it will really help researchers work uh, freely to improve the security of Swiss companies. Okay, interesting. Um, uh, Raphael said it could be, it might be even bad for companies the way it is right now and it's deterring for certain people to do this kind of research. 
Do you see this as well? I mean, you, you're teaching, Toby. Does, does uh, security industry or security research attract certain people? Or is it off-putting for other ones, maybe because of criminal code? Or how do you no, see that? No, I, I think usually it's not very off-putting. I think nowadays, because we have the bug bounty programs and people who are interested in it read up about it. It's, so it's easier to do this I kind think, of research now if you're interested. Yeah, I think most people just take the risk, let's put it that way. But uh, yes, the longer you do it, or the, if you do it professionally, I would also say it's better to have a company around you, have a contract that says, right? And that's oh, the penetration testing power. <laughs> there, there we will be again. But then, no, I, I still think that uh, we can just, uh, I agree, we, we should probably change the law and in general make, make this a point, right? Because um, I'm not even sure if my company will protect me when it comes to uh, civil uh, yeah, law, yeah. right? So um, it's also it can also be dangerous for penetration testing. Yeah, yeah I, I think I get... yeah I think we have common sense more for the judges here in Switzerland. So yeah. I'm not that afraid, but yeah. yeah, I think as long as everything is fine, it's great. But when an accident happens, things can go really wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I see that. Thank you guys. I think we need to come to the end of our program. I thank you, my guests for being here. Uh, Toby Zospel from Pentagrid, Raphael Arroyas, also known as Xel among his peers. Thank you very much for being here. Our next uh, Swiss Cyber Storm in Nutshell, we're planning for the end of April, but you know in these times you never quite know. And so this will be the next interview. We're going to do a couple of these now. Uh, this is a regular thing and now around the year. And then, of course, this year we're going to a Swiss Cyberstorm conference. So this will be Tuesday, the 12th of October. No matter pandemic, there is going to be a Cyberstorm. <laughs> Stay tuned. Stay tuned on our Twitter account. Renew on LinkedIn. Thank you very much for attending.